you put the same as it right here. But you swear in the firm that your testimony you should give the court today will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Say, okay, God. I did. Yes, sir. If you really want to have a seat, get as close to the mic as you can. For the purposes of the court, right? Please state your name and state. My name is Roger K. Quillen. Last name Q U I L L E N. And uh, good afternoon. Um, sorry it took so long to get to you because I know you've been down here all day. So I will try to be um, to the point. Could you please introduce yourself to the jurors by restating your name and telling them how you are employed? My name is Roger Quillen. And I am the uh, chairman of the management committee and the managing partner of the law firm Fisher Phillips. Okay. And um, can you tell the jurors how long have you served at Fisher Phillips in that capacity? I became the chairman of the firm in 1999 and have served continuously until today. Okay. And can you tell the jurors how long have you been employed at Fisher Phillips in total? I started with the firm in June of 1980, my first job out of law school. And uh, could you share a little bit with the jurors about your educational background? I grew up in a small town in Ohio, so I graduated from Newcomerstown High School. Uh, I went to Ohio State University uh, where I got a, a Bachelor of Science degree in Math Education, a Bachelor of Arts in Mathematics. I went to Purdue University where I got a master's degree in mathematics. Uh, then I went to Ohio State University again uh, to get my law degree, my JD. Are you a Buckeye or a Boilermaker? I'm a Buckeye. <laughs> um, would it be fair to say, Mr. Quillen, that you are intimately familiar with the inner workings of the firm? Yes. Um, are you kind of, to use the phrase, like the buck stops here, are you that guy? Yes, I am. And can you tell the jurors um, about how many employees um, does the Atlanta office of Fisher Phillips have? We, it, presently, we have about between 35 and 40 lawyers, uh, and then we have about an equal number of non-lawyer staff support. And um, could you tell the jurors where exactly, physically, is Fisher Phillips located here within the city of Atlanta? Our office is on the uh, 34th and 35th floors of the building at the corner of 12th, uh, 12th Street and Peachtree Street. How far is that from Piedmont and 12th? It is two short blocks. <clears throat> How long has the firm been located there at Peachtree and 12th? We moved in during the month of November of 2010. So as you sit here today, you guys have been there about eight years. It will be come November. Now, um, can you tell the jurors, um, the defendant here who is in court, Mr. Claude MacGyver, did you know Mr. MacGyver? Yes, I did. I do. I do know him. Okay. <clears throat> and can you tell the jurors, uh, how long have you known um, the defendant? When I interviewed for my job with Fisher Phillips in November of 1979, I interviewed with Mr. MacGyver. I remember that interview. Uh, and I joined the firm in June of 1980, and I've known him uh, as a uh, as a lawyer and a partner in the law firms ever since. Okay, and could you tell the jurors whether or not your relationship with Mr. McGuire does it extend outside a professional one? No, it does not. Um, and so, for instance, um, did you know um, Landon Diane McGuire? I, I I knew her in this sense. Um, in so firm-related social events, two of which occurred in my home, um, uh, I, I saw Tex and Diane together, so I knew her in that way. Uh, and also at firm social events, not in my home, but that's the only way. Okay. And so would you have ever had the occasion to visit uh, Putnam County property or anything like that? I never did. Never did. Can you tell the jurors how long did the defendant work at Fisher Phillips? I believe he began in 1972. 
That was my belief when I first came to the firm, and I have no reason to think otherwise. Uh, and worked there continuously until his last day in employment with the firm on December 31st, 2016. I want to show you a document. I've already shown it to the defense, Your Honor. It is marked for purposes of the record as State Exhibit Number 136. Take a look at that. And can you tell the jurors, do you recognize and can you identify that? Well, it, it's, it purports to be a letter from Tex McIver, actually Claude L. McIver III, uh, to, addressed to Mr. I. Walter Fisher, uh, whom I know to have been the founder and longtime managing partner of our law firm. It's dated August 4, 1972, and it's, um, it is a letter confirming his, that is Tex's, uh, acceptance of an offer of employment with the firm. Um. I will tender 136, Judge Kevin. No objection. 136 is now even more of it. <laughs> um, could you give me that date again, please, Mr. Poet? The date at the top of the letter is August 4, 1972. And does the letter um, talk about the proposed starting salary? It does. Uh, the letter says, text says, I accept your employment offer with a starting salary of $15,000 per year. Mr. Corbin, I want to ask you, um, at the time that you joined the firm um, in 1980, what was Mr. MacGyver's status there within the firm? You understand where I'm going with my question? Yeah. Okay. In those days, uh, we said he was a partner of the firm, uh, which meant he was a, uh, a co-owner of the law firm with the firm's other partners. The nomenclature has changed as the years have gone by, but that's what it was then. Okay. And um, can you tell the jurors, um, we, we just spoke to Mr. Nations. Uh, he, like you, been waiting all day. I really appreciate it. Can you tell the jurors, um, the phrase we have heard, equity partner, what does that mean? Until, oh, I, might, I might not have the year right about this, but until around 2007 or 2008, if you were a partner of our firm at all, then you were a fellow owner of the law firm. You had earned an equity interest in the law firm. And that was the only kind of partner there was. But starting, I believe, I could be off a year or so, but I believe around 2008, our law firm decided that there could be two kinds of partners in the firm. One referred to as an equity partner, which meant a fellow owner of the law firm, and another kind of partner called an income partner, which meant still holding the rank of partner, uh, but no longer having an ownership interest in the firm. And can you tell us the the uh, jury, um, when was the last official date that the defendant would have worked for official Phillips? In any capacity. In any capacity. December 31st, 2016. Can you tell the jurors, um, from 1980 when you joined the firm and knew Mr. MacGyver as a partner, um, did you know that status to change such that you became an equity partner? No. Anybody who was a partner of the firm in the old sense, which meant you were an owner of the firm, just simply became referred to when we, when we launched that second form of partnership. Then anybody who was at that time a partner of the firm automatically became an equity partner of the firm. It was just simply a title change. Okay. So can you tell the jurors, did uh, the defendant's status as an equity partner change during your tenure? It did. And can you tell the jurors, when did that occur? I could be off by a year, but I, I believe he remained an equity partner of the firm through the calendar year of 2013. And again, if I'm off a year, I apologize for that, but that's what I'm thinking right now. 2013. So December 31st, 2013. Through the completion of that year, I, I believe, if I'm, if I'm right about the year. Okay. And can you explain to the jurors, um, 
Why did that occur? It often happens in the career of one of our partners as they advance in the number of years of practice and age uh, that their performance begins to diminish in relation to the performance standards that we have for equity partners of the firm. And when we see that happening, uh, we typically will have a conversation with that equity partner at the time to say, it appears that your performance is diminishing and it's not going to return. This appears to be a steady diminishing level of performance. So at that time, we will uh, ask the partner uh, if the partner would agree to relinquish the status of equity partner to become an income partner of the firm, which would mean giving up their ownership interest in the firm, receiving their return of capital, because as an owner you have a capital stake in the law firm, and then going on a salary. And typically uh, that reduced, it, it, it is a reduction of compensation that goes with that, and a set of reduced performance standards. So, um, kind of in layman's terms for non-lawyers, performance standards would be what? Give us an example. Uh, we expect an equity partner of the firm uh, to uh, put in a, uh, a level of billable time, that is, hours that they work on, in the interest of clients and record them so that they can then be invoiced to the client for payment. Um, and, uh, and there are threshold standards for business development that we expect from equity partners as well. Now that's more fluid, I have to say. As a, as a partner is reaching the end of career, we're not real dogmatic about what that business development standard has to be, but what we're mostly talking about is what are they able to do in terms of the hours commitment, and particularly the billable hours commitment that they're able to make. And when we see that reducing, that's usually a sign for us we need to have that conversation. And was that the case with respect to the defendant? It was. And so, um, on the one hand, partners are expected to bill a certain number of hours to clients already in existence. Yes. Partners are also expected to develop new business. Yes. Objection to leading, Your Honor. That man was a couple questions in a row there. Oh, okay. I mean, I'm sort of setting some framework here, but let's let's keep it a little more open ended. Yes. Apparently, I should have. Yes. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, let me show you two exhibits I've already shown to the fence. Counsel, any objection, counsel? No objection. Thank you. Then I will tender States Exhibit 165 and States, exhibits, uh, States Exhibit 166 into evidence. Okay, there it is. All right. Um, sir, could you tell the jurors, do you recognize State's Exhibit 165 and 166? Yes, I do. And um, where did I get those documents from? From me. And when did I get them from? This morning. And um, you brought them with you? Yes. Explain why you brought them with you. Knowing that I might be asked about Mr. McIver's performance as it changed over the years, um, I, I took those home with me last night in my briefcase just to look at them to be sure that I, as best I could remember by the time I sat down here, uh, what was that year that he became an income partner and what really is the record of diminishing performance that the management committee of our firm had in mind when we were moving him into that status. Right. And um, those records, 165 and 166, they are kept in the ordinary course of the business there at Fisher Phillips. Yes, they are. Okay. Um, States 165, we got this little machine right here. I'm going to put it up in that way everybody can see it at the same time. Now I've kind of zoomed out just so we can give a little perspective uh, to the jurors and just tell them, generally speaking, Mr. Quillen, what are we looking at? Let me just ask. For a second, it, can that be sharpened up any, or is that as best it gets? Uh, no, I can tighten up a little bit. You tell me when to stop. Well, you can you can go smaller than that. I was thinking about clarity because it seems kind of fuzzy, but you, you, can, you can, can back off. Let me hit the auto focus. Would it be better if I put it in front of you? No, that's all right. Uh, you go ahead and, and back off so I can see the whole thing at one time. I just thought maybe you could focus a little better than that. Okay. Well, you know, this is the government, and I mean that jokingly. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
you need to do this. So, I'll tell you what I can do. I have a copy. Oh, thank you. That helps. Okay, overall, can you tell the jurors what are we looking at? For every single lawyer in our firm, when we get to the end of the so-called performance year, which for us ends on September 30th of each year, uh, our finance department, which is now headed by Mr. Nations, whom you, uh, you saw, our finance department produces for our management committee the three-year performance record for each lawyer. And so this, uh, this exhibit 165 shows Mr. P Mr. McIver's three-year performance record as we were starting the process there uh, to review performance and make decisions about compensation for the following calendar year. Okay. And so, so help the jurors understand um, is what the partner, his ability to perform in one year, does it reflect on his compensation the next year? Well, on, a, a, on, a, thro on a rolling three-year basis, so we, we don't make a lot of salary decisions based upon a one-year performance, but based upon the rolling three-year record, we do. Okay. So let's see. All right, now I've kind of zoomed in on the box down at the bottom left corner that says hours. Yes. And it starts at the bottom. Uh, it goes from 2015 down to 2014 and 2013. Yes. Now, can you explain that to the jurors? Sure. We, we, when we read this, we read from the bottom up. So we, we start by looking at 2013. And so there are, as you can see, there are four boxes that are outlined on this page. Uh, if you look to the bottom left box, which is the one uh, that is uh, shown on the TV screen there, the bottom left box is, is our examination of the person's performance against billable hour, I'm sorry, billable and overall hour expectations. So what you see there is that in 2013, uh, for reasons I no longer recall, he had a very reduced billable hour standard. A normal billable hour standard for a full-time partner of the firm is 1,750 billable hours. Um, tax, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, I what I recall roughly is that the firm had assigned him some other responsibilities uh, during that year, um, uh, and, uh, and therefore he got a reduction against the billable hour standard, which would normally have been 1,750. Uh, down to that number that you see, 1,120, and I no longer have any recollection about why, uh, but I, I do recall that there was a reason for that reduced standard. And against that standard, which you see um, sort of in a light, almost italics uh, text there, billable hours goal, you see that 1,120, and then you can see what he actually did during the performance year that ended September 30, 2013. Uh, and you can see that in that year, he exceeded that reduced billable hour standard. Uh, and then if you go out to the right, uh, the right most in the same box on the same line, you will see that his total hours goal uh, for that year was 1,833. The, oh, sorry. Um, and before we, we go too far, so for 2013, we see the 1,120, that number reflects what? That is the billable hour standard that was personalized for him. Uh, our lawyers, they don't all have the same standard, so going into a year, we, we establish a standard of expectation for them. And now I do remember that in 2013, as his last year as an equity partner of the firm, <clears throat> he was on a reduced schedule. Uh, which, and I can't remember the level of the reduction, but there was some reduction as he was, we already knew he was scaling toward a conversion to income partner status. And so there was a reduction in, in those standards. Okay. And so um, the goal for the defendant in this case in, is in 2013, Fisher Phillips expected him to be able to build at least 1,120 hours throughout the course of the year. Yes. And the, by the way, the year, meaning that year that ends September 30 each year. Okay. 
And so explain that to the jurors. It's it's there's, a, there's an artificial 12-month period that we use to evaluate our lawyers' performance. And it starts October 1 each year and ends September 30th each year. And the reason is that it gives us an opportunity to close out the performance so that we can then make decisions and do our analysis and make decisions and set the person's compensation effective January 1 in the next new year. Um, and as you told us, I want to make sure the jurors can follow along. So in 2013, um, the defendant actually billed 1,134 hours. Yes, he did. Exceeded it. He, received, he exceeded that reduced standard. Okay. What does the 881 reflect? 881, that, that's under a column called FNP hours. Um, way back in the remote history of the law firm, long before I came along, uh, the founders and leaders of the firm decided that there were other kinds of hours that, that were not billable to clients, but they were valuable hours. They were hours that were uh, invested by the lawyer in things that were in the interest of our clients or of the business of the firm and that they deserved to be recorded and credited. So, uh, for as long as I can recall, those hours have been credited. I mean, they have been recognized. And so, um, he logged that year 881 of those hours. Okay. 2015, that number reflects? That is the sum, I hope, that is the sum of 1,134 and 881. That is what we call his total good hours. We refer to those as good hours, either billable or other kinds of hours that deserve to be credited. Okay. And the last column. The last column uh, what is the total hours goal. So normally for every full-time lawyer in the firm, that is 2,000. And that is my clue to see that as 1833. <coughs> because he had a reduced standard, uh, then he must have been, in his last year as an equity partner, uh, we had given him a reduction against normal standards, which again is, is, is a very normal thing for us to do. Okay. So sum, summarizing then, sorry, um, you can see that he uh, slightly beat the billable hours goal that he had for that year, and he beat by a wide margin his total hours goal for that year. Okay. So January 1, 2014, the defendant becomes an income partner. Yes. Okay. Take us through how he did. That year. And again, we're just focusing on hours right now. Right. Okay. So, as he became an income partner, we now moved his, uh, the expectations for him uh, down in overall hours. You can see that reduction to 1,600. That tells me, that one number right there, 1,600, tells me that he was on a plan, a performance plan, with an expectation of 80% of normal overall hours. Again, a fairly standard uh, move as somebody moves into income partner status at the end of their career. Okay. And um, how about 2015? Uh, 2015, you can see that uh, he remained at the 80% uh, level for overall hours. Uh, and you can see that uh, that year his total hours uh, logged were 1,749. Okay. But I see in 2015, the billable hours goal was 1373. Yes. And this number here, 1002, that reflects what? 1002 in 2015 were the, that's the number of billable hours that he worked and logged into our timekeeping system in that performance year that ended uh, September 30, 2015. So did he meet the standard that year? Uh, no, he did not. How about the year before? The year before, he also missed the standard by, uh, by a wide margin. His uh, billable hour expectation that year uh, was, uh, in 2014 that is, was 1,320. And he, uh, he worked and logged 1,061 billable hours that year, missing that standard by whatever that difference is. Okay. Now, um, um, Should we go to 166 now? To you, talk about I yes. Mean, uh, unless you want to talk about the business development part of this piece of paper. Uh, but um, yes. Can you, can you summarize that for the jurors? The business development part. Sure. I'm sorry. Sure. So, partners of the firm also have uh, tailored 
that is personalized uh, business development goals as well. So to be a partner of the firm, uh, not only a, a, an equity partner, but even many or most of our uh, income partners, uh, we, we set for them an expectation of the dollars that the firm will receive in payments from clients, um, in payment for services that the firm has rendered. And the clients he's getting credit for, or any lawyer's getting credit for, are clients that he originated to the firm. That is, he was the reason the client came to our firm. Or, there's another way, and that is to generate new matters from, uh, from the firm's clients. Uh, clients that someone else has originated. So the sum of those two forms of so-called business development dollars uh, is that number that you see, um, his um, O and R received. So if you, yeah, if, right there, uh, so we're zooming in there. If you look to ONR received, the raw dollars that were paid to the firm by clients for the firm's services that he got business development credit for, those numbers in 2013 were 1,087. In 2014, not much difference, 1,064. In 2015, 1,047,000. But that's not the end of the story because we also do a profitability analysis in our law firm. We don't treat all business development dollars that arrive as being equal necessarily because some client relationships are more profitable than others. And so having done our profitability analysis, what we credited him for in those three years was in 2013 he was credited with the raw number 1,087,000. In 2014, uh, the dollars he brought into the firm were deemed by our financial department to be highly profitable. And therefore, uh, they were grossed up in, in our treatment to 1.3 million, 1 million plus. In the last year on this sheet, 2015, the 1,047,000 of dollars that actually came through the door uh, were, were analyzed as being considerably less profitable than the firm's on average. And therefore, uh, in our reckoning, as we were examining his performance, we treated his business development dollars for our purposes as $769,000. Out to the right, you will see that in, uh, you'll see out there at the extreme right of that long box, in 2015, the expectation for, uh, for tax in that year was that his business development dollars would normalize to $1.5 million or more. And so, um um, his business development there at the firm was going down. Uh, well, just to be, just to be clear, uh, in, from 2013 to 2015, his business development dollars, raw dollars that were arriving in our receivables department, those raw dollars were drifting ever so slightly down. Uh, if you look to the profitability of those dollars, uh, you'll see that in 2013, they were, it was just like the raw dollars that came. Then he got credited with a lot more than came in. And then the next year, he got credited with a lot less than came in. But in every case, missing that standard by a wide margin. And that standard, while I don't have it on a piece of paper for 2013 and 2014, I am absolutely confident that that standard was never less than 1.5. It could possibly have been more uh, at, at one of these earlier years, but it was definitely not less than 1.5 because the standard was being reduced as time went by. Okay. Now, State's Exhibit 166, does that include the calendar year of 2016? Uh, well, not calendar year, but again... I'm sorry. Yes, that, yeah. that reporting year. Yes, reporting year. Yeah, so the difference between 166 and 165, these two exhibits, is that we now just move one one year further along so that we are now looking at the last year, 2016, the last year that Tex was employed by the firm. Okay. I'm going to switch out with you so I can actually show the jurors that actually exhibit. You can. Okay. Now, um, before we talk about State's Exhibit 166, can you tell the jurors, um, were there conversations with the defendant about retiring from the firm? Uh, there were. Uh, those conversations had been going on for, I, don't, I can't say how long, but certainly 
more than a year before 2016. Okay. And can you tell the jurors what was the understanding with respect to the defendant's retirement from Fisher Phillips? Tex told us that his plan was to, uh, was to work through 2017, calendar year 2017, and at that point uh, he would expect to take what we call senior counsel status. Senior counsel status. Yes. What is that? For lawyers who have been with the firm for a long time and typically they've been an equity partner, now they've gone through a reduced period as an income partner with reduced compensation, eventually the time will come <clears throat> when we move those people off salary status and out of the title partner and they go on to a performance plan, a compensation plan that is entirely contingent upon what they're able to accomplish, either in dollars generated by their own billable time as an attorney, or dollars that they generate through originating a business for the law firm. Um, and at that point, once they're senior counsel, we negotiate with them as they move into that status a formula. And a very typical formula would be to say, for instance, uh, the firm will pay you 30% of the dollars the firm receives for your billable time and the firm will pay you, sometimes we say 20%, we have on occasion said 30% of the dollars that you're generating for, to the firm from origination of business, whether you service it or not. And if somebody originates it and services the business, they can get both, the 30% plus the either 20 or 30%. So you discussed with the defendant that, hey, in 2017, you're going to take senior counsel status. And if he originates business to the firm, he get a number of $100,000. Well, not quite. I, a, you said 2017. So the plan, the plan was that 2017 would be his last year as an income partner. And then at the end of 2017, he would then lay down that status and become a senior counsel. So really, it's 2018 then? 2018 would have okay. been his first year as a senior counsel. Okay. Thank you for correcting me on that. So, um, the second hypothetical. Originate some business there at Fisher Phillips. Say, um, billables, $100,000. Um, if you agreed to get 30% of what he originated, he would take home from Fisher Phillips how much? You're saying he originated $100,000 in business and dollars were paid to the firm? Yes. Um, then he would have earned under that, under that, I'm going to assume, let's, let's assume he's on the 30% plan, okay. uh, then he would have gotten 30% of $100,000 received or $30,000. Right. And if he also serviced the business, mm -hmm. then he gets a little bit more. Yeah, so depending upon the deal that we struck with him as an individual, he might have gotten either 20 or 30% or something in between of that $100,000. And so it would be an additional twenty dollars to $30,000. Okay. So can you explain to the jurors if... Um, the conversation with the defendant was that he would work through 2017 as an income partner. Yes. Why did his service come in December 31st, 2016? So, on a date in late September that you've, you've heard about, um, there was the, the tragedy involving his wife. Uh, <laughs> naturally. Uh, to our expectation, at least naturally, uh, Texas' complete attention was diverted at that point from the interest of the firm's clients or the interest of the business of the firm. And again, no recriminations, just naturally it was. So as this drug on, uh, well, we, first we, we put Tex on an extended bereavement leave and said, you go out there and you take care of, you take care of yourself and take care of the affairs that you need to take care of and we'll continue you on pay status. And we left that open-ended. As we moved late in the year, um, we, we began to feel that uh, the chances of Tex ever being able to return his full attention to the business of our clients and the business of the firm was highly unlikely. It just didn't seem likely to us. So we entered into a conversation with him where we said, you know, Tex, our plan and your plan 
was that 2017 was going to be your last year with the firm as an income partner anyway. Um, why don't we talk about the possibility of you accelerating your retirement plans to retire at the end of 2016 instead of dragging this out to the end of 2017? Okay. And um, was that something that um, the defendant actually agreed to do? Initially, he was not really inclined in that direction uh, and told us so. Uh, as, as he expressed it, he really, he expected that things would be such that he would be able to return his attention to clients and the interests of the firm. And, um, and he, he really was hopeful when we were having this conversation with him about possibly accelerating retirement. He was really hopeful uh, that this thing he was facing would would be behind him uh, and that after some mental adjustment time he would be able to get back to uh, performing at, at a higher level. So initially, no, he, he, he did not really uh, want to do that because to him, just, sorry. If we could just stick to what Mr. McIver said, I think it sounds like maybe we're drifting a little bit into speculation about what he was thinking. Okay. Fair point. Okay. And um, of course, you understand what Ms. Um, Clark Palmer is saying, right, Ms. Wilson? Sure. Okay. Uh, but you did have these conversations with Ms. McGuire. Yes. And can you tell the jury, are we talking about like one conversation or were like back and forth conversations? There was only one conversation that I was part of. Okay. And can you tell the jury if some of um, what you have talked about with the jurors, was it reduced to writing in the form of an email? Uh, it was. Okay. Were there email exchanges back and forth between yourself and the defendant about this topic? I, I think there was. I, I, I don't have any recollection about how many emails there might have been in the chain like that, but I do recall that there was, there was a little back and forth. Okay. Any objection? Okay. Let me show you a document. It's been marked as State's Exhibit Number 134. And there being no objection, Your Honor, I will tender states 134 in evidence. Okay. 134 is in there. Okay. Let's talk farmer. 134A. Yes. Okay. No objection. No objection. Okay. Um, state's exhibit number 134 that's in front of you is about blue up here. It's been marked as states 134A as a demonstrative. Can you just tell the jurors this email we're looking first of all, is it an email? It is. Okay. And it is from whom to whom? Uh, starting as far back as possible, this this starts with an email from me to text. Okay. And then he responds back to you? He does. So let's um, start with um, what date do you send the defendant an email? It says December 16th, 2016. And um, can you tell the jurors what time you send your email? This says I sent this uh, at 5.56 p.m. on that day. Okay. And so you get a response email back from the defendant on what date? The, this piece of paper says uh, that on Saturday, December 17th, uh, text sent me this email copying the other two members of the management committee. And what time did you send this email? 8.20 a.m. On, on that Saturday morning. Okay. And um, uh, Mr. Quillen, would you mind please reading the email that text sent to you? I've got some jurors right here. So wait. All right. It says, like a good soldier, I am eager to continue in this direction. My hesitation comes from simply trying to think about what we have missed by way of disengagement after 44 years of functioning on this platform. Just one example, announcements to the client base and network of referring practitioners slash friends for which I am responsible. In many instances, there is a very close personal bond which I feel obligated to manage for their transition, whatever that might be. Clearly, I have ensured FNP is embedded in their operations, but have no clue how they will react or what their expectations will be of me such as expecting to be personally introduced to F and D lawyers. Remember, this group extends well beyond Atlanta. 
as you suggest, permit me the weekend to focus more. And he says that back to you in response to you saying what to him. My email that precedes that is uh, it's kind of lengthy, so it's uh, most of most of three pages. Okay. How about this? Um, you've read the email and reviewed it prior to your testimony, right? Well, not not really. No, not good. Really. Okay. Um, um, the court talked about that one break. Um, you want a five minute break? Just a five minute. If we could let Mr. Quillen read the email, that might speed things along. Okay, so what we're going to do today, folks, rather than the typical day, if there ever is one, is a sort of a longer break between the time we start and lunch, and then a longer break between lunch and the end of the day. Uh, but some folks like to have little breaks uh, that are closer together. That's just how it's worked today. So we're going to take a little break, five minutes ish. Uh, as soon as you guys are ready, after five minutes, we'll bring you back in here. If you need more time, you can take it. Don't talk about the case or doing outside research while you're back in the jury room. And we'll get you back in here. Thank you. All rise for the jurors. Please be seated. Anything else, Mr. Rucker, before we break? No, sir. This is Clark Palmer. Yeah, you're on. All right. I'll be back in a couple minutes. All jurors are present and accounted for you on. Okay, everyone else can be seated. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to pick up with the direct examination that maybe is wrapping up with Mr. Quillen. Um, oh, Deputy Murphy. Yes, sir. Thank you, jurors. Hey, you know, TMI. Um, we just won't start. We'll wait. Deputy Murphy's going to do counting lessons uh, during our, our evening. Day. Yeah. Oh, we're losing another one. It's the bad flow. That was a test. I actually asked the one to stay behind. You guys did a great job. Now everyone is kind of <laughs> Thank you, sir. All right. So we left off with Mr. Rucker uh, in the midst of his direct examination of Mr. Quillen. Mr. Quillen is still under oath, and it sounds like he's had a chance to review his part of this email exchange. Back to you, Mr. Rucker. Thank you. Um, you didn't have a chance to review the email. Yes. The break. Okay. So, generally speaking, what was it that your email was communicating to um, the defendant that caused him to respond back to you that you've already read? I have to say, apparently, after the meeting we had, the live meeting that the management had with Tex, which I, I think was on December 12th, but I, maybe I'm not quite right. Um, he must have followed up with some questions to the management committee about some of the details of what it would mean for him to accelerate his retirement. And while I don't recall any conversation with him after that meeting, uh, it's apparent that he must have raised questions somehow. Um, and so this is my response on behalf of our management committee to the things he had raised. So this email is, is saying what we can do uh, to meet his requests. <clears throat> and then if you get to the second page, then there's a little break there, a sentence that says, we won't be able to say yes to settle of the things you requested. And then there are quite a few bullet points there um, that, uh, that go through that list. And then we get to the, uh, the paragraph that says, as for severance compensation, and we explain there that what we had been thinking about compensating him in 2017 in his last year on salary with the firm, we had been thinking that that number would be 150, 150,000. Uh, but we had decided to uh, raise that number somewhat uh, for purposes of wrapping things up with him. Uh, and so we had agreed to raise that number to $180,000. Uh, and so that's about it. Uh, I, he asked a couple other questions apparently, and, and we try to answer those questions as we're getting to the end of the letter. Okay. On page two, could you read for the juror, what is it that you tell Mr. MacGyver, the defendant, that you won't be able to say yes to the things he requested? You, you just want me to read those bullet points? Yes, sir. Okay. We don't want to extend your hard stop date beyond December 31, 2016. This date needs to hold, and it needs to be a clean break, except for the continuing compensation feature I'll summarize below. 
This means that as, Jan as of January 1, 2017, you will have no continuing employment status with the firm and you will need to return your electronic key cards. We will grant you access to the Atlanta office space on an as-needed basis, but that will have to be arranged in advance with an assigned staff person, probably Beth Bauman, who will arrange to let you into the space outside of regular hours and have someone remain with you until you have finished. Because we do not want you to engage in the practice of law following your retirement, and even think it is a bad idea for you to do that, we will not provide clerical or other staff support to assist you in doing that. We continue to encourage you to disengage from all legal work and to refer all matters to someone else. Consistent with your hard retirement date, you will no longer appear on the firm's website. You will no longer have access to the firm's electronic network. And then moving to page, the next page, we have decided not to offer any monetary incentive for you to refer work to the firm. Because we want your retirement to be a clean break, not only in reality, but also in the way people inside and outside the firm view it, we think it would be inconsistent to have you marketing on behalf of the firm and we don't encourage you to do that. And that's the end of the bullet points, and then it does go on from there. And so, um, with that um, statement, that you don't want the defendant to be marketing on behalf of the firm and don't encourage you to do it, this notion of a senior counsel status in your mind was what? Off the table. Off the table. Now, um, the compensation that you discussed um, as a final, what would be the right characterization for the 180? Severance payments. Severance payments. Um, can you tell the jury, um, did you actually, was a document actually drafted for the defendant's signature to, um, for that contract, for that severance payment? Yes. Let me show you states 135. Any objection, counsel? Um, right. No objection. I'll tender 135 judge and evidence. 135 is admitted. What is State's Exhibit 135? <clears throat> this is the document prepared by uh, one of our lawyers in the firm and presented to Mr. McIver for his signature. And had he signed, uh, it would have set the contractual terms for his resignation and separation from the firm. And the offer for severance was to the tune of $180,000. Yes. Based on his expected salary received for that upcoming year of $150,000. Yes. And um, did you say that it was never signed? Correct. And so was that $180,000 payment ever paid to the defendant? No. And so in calendar year 2017, can you tell the jurors how much compensation did Fisher Phillips pay to the defendant? I believe it was none unless there was some residual payment for some reason that slopped over from 2016. Um, let me just show you one more document. This is State Exhibit. Any objection? Uh, no objection. Uh, Your Honor, I'm tender main states exhibit 133. It's admitted. Uh, Mr. Quillen, can you tell the jurors what is states exhibit 133? <clears throat> this is the retirement letter, the notice of his retirement that he sent to our management committee dated December 19th, 2016. Okay. And, um... Can you tell the jurors what is the date of the retirement letter for the defendant? Uh, it's December 19, 2016. And what date was his, um, is his resignation effective? His last day on pay status with the firm was December 31, 2016. Okay. And finally, let me just show you this real quick. 
I just want to ask you about one thing. This is States 166. Yes. The um, billable hours goal for the defendant in 2016 was what? Uh, for the performance year, which remember ended September 30th of 2016, yes. the expectation was that his he would have 1,050 billable hours. And what did he actually have? 482. Um, what did you say about that? That was uh, a very, very deep underperformance against standard. Underperformance against standard? Yes. Would that be reflective of the salary he earned uh, in 2016? Well, no. No, it, this, his performance in 2016 would have had a lot to do with why we were inclined to pay him $150,000 in 2017. That number you see there, uh, $275,000 next to 2016, that was, that was the firm's plan for his base compensation for that calendar year, 2016. When we had things proceeded in due course, had there been no such thing as the shooting, then the firm's performance year would close, as always, on September 30th of 2016. And based upon the numbers that we would then have in front of us, um, which are reflected on this sheet, this, uh, this exhibit, is it 136? It's 166. 166. All right. So, thank you. Yes, 166. So, here you go. You can have it back if you want to put it on the screen. So, as we, if things had proceeded in due course, we, we would have been looking at this three-year rolling record and we would, have, we, would have, uh, we would have looked at that very deep drop in performance in billable hours and overall hours and in business development. And we would have reduced his compensation by, by a very steep amount. That's how we had, we hadn't decided this at the time of the shooting because we didn't even have the final numbers yet for the performance year. But once we had them, by the time we were talking to Tex in December, now three months later, we were telling him that our plan for your salary going into 2017, if everything had proceeded normally, we would have dropped you to 150. Um, the law firm of Fisher and Phillips, I heard you say you had been there for your whole career? Yes. And you all represent employers? Yes. And defend employers? Um, lawsuits and other things that they are facing? Yes. Fisher and Phillips is not a plaintiff's law firm, correct? Correct. You don't fight for the slip and fell right now and I wanted to sue the county. That's not the type of legal work that Fisher and Phillips handles. That's right. Okay. And um, Mr. McIver also worked at Fisher and Phillips for his entire career, do you know? Uh, my understanding is that he left the uh, Air Force JAG Corps, and from that time, uh, I know that he came to Fisher Phillips uh, in 1972 and never worked for any other law firm after that. All right. And you told us that you had met Diane McIver. Yes. And um, they sounded like social settings, although it didn't sound like you considered yourself to necessarily have a social relationship with the McIver. That's all correct. And uh, how many times do you think you saw Tex and Diane McIver in a social setting? Just, I mean, just... R roughly, five? roughly ten. Okay. On the, and those are ten occasions um, over the years that they were together? Correct. And you had a chance to observe them together at those social meetings? I did. And you observed, am I right, uh, that they appeared to be a happy couple? Yes. They appeared to be in love with each other? Yes. They appear to be proud to be married to each other? Yes, I would use that word. Okay. Uh, do you know how old Mr. McIver is? I believe he's 75. Um, in 2018, correct? We're in 2018 right now. I, I believe his birthday is late in December each year, um, and, um, uh, and I think he turned 75 in December, I think. Okay. Um, so in 2013, he would have been 70 or in his early 70s. We can do that's right. Yeah. All right. And 
Um, you told us about how in 2013, um, and before that, he was an equity partner. Yes. And you explained to us what equity partner meant. And we talked about the transition to income partner. Isn't it part of a, a attorney's normal progression in their career with your experience at Fisher and Phillips that as they get older and start to near what might be a retirement age, their status at the firm might change? Yes. Okay. And isn't it true that Mr. McIver's status as an equity partner, he maintained that status for longer than many other lawyers have maintained that status? Yes, I would say that. Okay. And we went over... Um, some hours and, and uh, I think it was uh, State's Exhibit 165 and 166 and you explained to us kind of what these numbers meant. Um, but let me talk to you about kind of the, the originating numbers and I can't, what's, what does the R stand for? R is, uh, stands for the word responsible, and that means that those are dollars received by the firm for work that he generated for someone else's originating client. Okay, so originating clients that he brought to the firm, right? Right. And those, those numbers we see up there, I know they're a little blurry, those numbers aren't necessarily all the hours he worked on those clients. Correct. But those are the hours the firm was able to bill to clients that he brought to the firm. Right. Those are the dollars that clients paid for the firm's services, and he gets credit for it if he originated the client's relationship, no matter who does the work. Okay. Um, are you familiar with the term book of business? Certainly. And is it fair, and correct me if I'm wrong, to say that a book of business is, is a, a lawyer's clients that he has brought to the firm? Yes. And um, Tex had a book of business that was, well, let me say in 2015, um, and again, if I have a year wrong or anything, let me know. Is it fair to say that Tex McIver had a book of business that was worth somewhere between $1 million and $1.5 million? In 2015? Yes. Correct. Okay. And that's, that's important to the firm, isn't it? Yes, it is. Okay. All right, so I don't want to belabor this too much because we spent a lot of time going over the numbers, but I just want to make sure we have the total hours correct. And I'm looking at, I think this is 165. It's the one for 2015. And you explained to us already the difference between billable hours, F&P hours, but the the way I read this document, am I reading it right that each year Mr. McIver exceeded his total hours goal? Yes, that's right. Okay. Maybe not his billable hours goal, but he exceeded his total hours goal. Correct. Okay. And for the three years that are reflected on this document, 2013, 2014, 2015, um, the O and R number is fairly consistent all right around a million dollars. Correct. All right. And you explained to, this, to us how that gets adjusted, but these are dollars that actually came into the firm. Those are the actual dollars received. Okay. Am I correct? Oh, well, let me back up too. Um, I asked you about, you know, book of business and what that meant. Um, there's also such a thing as client loyalty and, and whether clients will keep their work with your firm or if they'll go to other firms. Correct. And Mr. McIver had clients who were loyal to him and loyal to your firm. That is correct. Okay. In 2013, that's when you told us there was a conversation about changing his status from equity partner to income partner. Was it in 2013 or before that? That dialogue started somewhat earlier than 2013, but, uh, but we had come to an understanding with Tex at some point, certainly no later than the beginning of 2013, I would say, uh, that this would be his last year as an equity partner. The reason I know that, that it had to have been decided in advance, was because I can see that his overall hour standard for 2013 uh, was less than 2,000. And that, that suggests a reduction in, in our expectation 
and we would not reduce an equity partner's overall expectation of ours if it weren't on a plan. Okay. And again, that's, that is not unusual for a lawyer who is advancing in his years for there to be a conversation about gearing him towards retirement or senior counsel staff. Not at all unusual. Okay. So let me contrast that, though. If you have a lawyer who was um, younger and earlier in their career who was not meeting their billable hour standards, would you have a conversation with them about becoming senior counsel, or would the conversation be, you may need to go find work at some other law firm? We would not be offering senior counsel to a, uh, a, a younger lawyer whose performance was falling apart. Um, we might have a conversation about them leaving equity partner, the equity partner ranks and being reduced to a salaried attorney of the firm. So it wouldn't necessarily be get lost, uh, but there would certainly be a strong conversation that they could not remain a, an owner of the firm. Okay. Moving to senior counsel status is sort of a recognition of, of the work you've done in the past for the firm, isn't it? It is. That's only offered to people at the end of, of a... Uh, you know, an admirable and respected career, and they get that as a sort of the final way to have a relationship with the firm. When just before we leave 2016 and, and this government's Exhibit 166, I saw that the billable hours in 2016 was way down. Yes. Um, but in 2016, Mr. McIver wasn't billing any hours or not billing very many after Diane died. Is that correct? Well, remember the performance year ends on September 30. Okay, that's right. That's right. I forgot about that. Thank you. Okay, so we went through um, we went through the communications you had with Mr. McIver after Diane died. Um, I think that was a. What's the number on that? 134. Right, 134. So let me kind of talk about sort of the time frame of, of what happened then. Um, uh, Mr. McIver, um, you became aware that Diane McIver died, didn't yes. you? Yes. Okay. And Mr. McIver called you. Yes. And you had a conversation with him where he communicated to you that Diane had died. Yes. And in that conversation, was he crying? He was very emotional. His, his voice was real choked up. He had a little trouble talking. Okay. Was it a brief conversation? It was brief. Okay. And, and that was uh, close in time to when Diane died? Well, as I recall, now that I've actually seen the phone record, uh, that phone call occurred in the afternoon of the day following the event of that night. So the very next day, but in the afternoon. All right. And also, you know who Bill Crane is, don't you? I do. All right. And you know that Bill Crane does um, uh, public relations work. Yes. And was Bill Crane ever, Bill Crane was never employed by Fisher and Phillips to do PR work, was he? <laughs> Not that I'm aware of. Um, I was made aware that he, on his website, uh, had a reference to our law firm as a client, which was news to me, but uh, I'm not aware of him performing public relations work for our law firm. But to your knowledge, Fisher and Phillips, at any time, never hired Bill Crane? Not that I know of. Okay. After Diane died, you became aware that Bill Crane's website had Fisher and Phillips listed as a client? Yes. And the firm told Bill Crane in strong and very certain terms, he needed to remove the Fisher and Phillips name from his website. Yes. In fact, you all were prepared to take legal action against him if he didn't if he didn't comply with that demand. We probably would have. Okay. Being a law firm, right? right. Okay. <clears throat> um, and that would have been that those those demands to Bill Crane. Um, to take the Fisher and Phillips name off his law firm, uh, off his website, those were very close in time to when Diane died. Yes. Okay. I'm talking about like within days or weeks, maybe. Well, I, I would tie it to whenever Mr. Crane decided to go to the newspapers to tell a story. I, I, I sometimes shortly after that. Okay. So then, 
Now let me move forward and talk about uh, Governance 134, which is this letter or this email that's dated in December some three months after yes. Diane has, has died, right? Yes. And um, there's a, a little bit of negotiation going on between the firm and Mr. McIver. Yes. Um, one thing that lawyers do, or one thing that you do as a lawyer is negotiate, don't Yes. You? Okay. And, um, the need for these kind of negotiations and discussions about um, Mr. McIver leaving the firm all came about because of everything that surrounded Diane's death, right? And in other words, let me say, you, you likely wouldn't have been having these types of communications if Mr. McIver had taken the senior counsel status as plan. Correct. This was, not, this was not part of the plan for him to take senior counsel status that you all had talked about um, before. But no, well, it was, it was the plan, had there been no death of Diane, the plan was that 2017 would have been Texas' last year as a regularly employed income partner of the firm, at which time we would have expected him to become senior counsel. Okay. And um, just to make sure this is clear, because I'm, I'm not certain that we talked about it before, the, the plan and the talk about, if I use the word retiring, is that okay to use that kind of synonymously with taking senior counsel status, or do you think it's different? It may be slightly different for this reason. When someone becomes senior counsel, they are in charge of their complete destiny. They can do anything they want. They can do something. They can do nothing. Many lawyers go off into senior counsel status and do nothing, and therefore they receive no contingent compensation on that formula I was telling you about earlier. But some lawyers do. So uh, I never know when someone goes into senior counsel status whether they consider that to be going into retirement or whether they continue to, they want to remain as active as possible and earn as much money as possible. I don't know what to expect. Okay, well, so let me stick with the term senior counsel status. <laughs> okay. um, the, the decision was reached, or the agreement was reached that Tex was going to take senior counsel status sometime back in 2016. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm sorry, you have to say yes or no. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so I, I'm not sure. I, I can't really say 2016. There was a timetable that Tex had in mind that 2017 would be his last year as, a, as an active income partner of the firm, and he then expected, I know he expected to move to senior counsel status moving into 2018. Okay. I don't know when that conversation occurred, but I, I know that it was a shared plan. And, and that plan, um, when that came about, it was occurring at the same time that there was another lawyer at the firm who was planning to retire or move to senior counsel. Yes. Who was that? Tom Rebel. Okay. And Tom Rebel and Mr. McIver knew each other. Yes. Um, and in fact, Mr. McIver had sort of um, mentored, is that a, a fair word? That's correct. Mr. Rebel. And so they kind of came to an agreement at the same time. Maybe not together, but sort of at the same time, they both came to an agreement with the firm that they were going to take senior counsel status. Yes. Right. So the, the the meeting with Mr. McIver in December of 2016, the back and forth uh, email that we went through, the need for these conversations arose because of everything that happened with Diane's death and those surrounding events, right? That's that's why you. The, the plan for him to retire was um, reached and accelerated to that day. Yes. Okay. And I know this may sound a little you know, silly and, and stupid, but clearly December 16, 2016 is after Diane died. Almost three full months. And I understood that you told us on direct that you all had agreed that you would give a severance $180,000 to Mr. McIver. Yes. But he never got that money. That's right. Because he never signed a severance agreement. Right. So he left that $180,000 on the table, so to speak. Yes. Okay. And um, if I may take... Uh, this one, Governance Exhibit 133 from you. And I'm going to put it up on the Elmo so we can... We, we 
introduced this on your direct but didn't get into the contents of it. This is the letter that's dated December 19th, 2016, correct? Yes. And it's from Tex um, to yourself and the other members of the management committee. Yes. And in this letter, Mr. McIver says that he has decided to retire from Fisher & Phillips effective December 31st, 2016. Yes. He says he had hoped to remain active as a partner through 2017, but recent personal events of which you are aware are making it impossible for me to contribute in the manner expected of the firm's partners and even more in the way I expect of myself. Yes. Okay. And then we get down to the third paragraph. He says, given the pain I continue to feel over the loss of my beloved Diane, it probably sounds hollow when I say I am so sad about this premature retirement from the firm, but it's true. Even when weighed against more serious matters, I want you to know that this decision to retire is painful to me, but I also know it's the right thing to do. Yes. Okay. The last paragraph, I have been hurt so deeply by the fake news, fake news in quotes, about the accident that I want to say how much it means to me when I hear my partner's words of comfort and support. Please express to everyone my appreciation for that and also my sincere regret over the impact this terrible accident has had on the firm. I am hopeful the partners will see in my decision to retire my last act of service to the law firm I have loved and humbly served for all these 44 plus years. Yes. And then he signed it respectfully, Tex. Yes. All right. Thank you, Mr. Quillen. Those are all my questions. Mr. Rucker, any redirect? Very briefly. Um, Mr. Quillen, can you tell the jurors what's the amount you earn as senior counsel? It's uh, entirely contingent upon your performance. And so as I was saying earlier, it's a negotiated plan, but typically it's 30% of the amount of originations that you generate for the firm, uh, plus a percentage of the dollars received to the firm, by the firm, for work you actually performed as a lawyer. And it can be a double dip. It can be that you originate the work and service the work. Okay. Can you tell the jurors what type of work was done by the defendant? What type of work did he do? Yes. Uh, so, Tex, um, Tex had a, 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 a practice that consisted very heavily of consulting with clients in their labor and employment needs. Uh, so at this stage of his career, he was really not doing litigation. Uh, most of his work was helping clients think through their employment-related business problems and either plan to avoid problems or help them to address those problems if they arose. Uh, give us a typical of an example of one of his clients. Who it would be? You mean the name of the client? Uh, yeah, I'd rather not do not that. Not necessarily the name, but you know, if you could just kind of give us a context. Yeah. So let's say uh, he might have a client that was involved in manufacturing something. Okay, so he would represent the company. Yeah, our law firm represents companies, employers. Okay, and litigation against whom? We uh, almost exclusively are defending uh, our clients against litigation brought by plaintiffs uh, because of some allegation of something that went wrong for them in the workplace. Um, why was the call from, first of all, the phone call you had with Mr. MacGyver where he was kind of choked up? Yes. Um, you believe that was on the day or the day after? The shooting? I believe it was the, the day after. Okay. And um, you referenced some phone records. When did you see phone records? Uh, when I visited uh, Mr. Howard's office at the, uh, to the district attorney's office, I was shown a, a phone record, one page of phone record. Okay. And um, why was the phone call uh, with Mr. MacGyver uh, regarding his wife's death so brief? Mr. McIver, uh, as I said, was emotional, and then at some point in that very short conversation, he began to, he wanted to tell me what had happened. And being a lawyer, sorry, I stopped him immediately and said, Tex, I don't want to hear anything about what happened. I, I don't want to end up being a fact witness someday if this thing ends up being a problem. So it was short. 
and look at you today. <laughs> um, okay. Um, the retirement letter, were there multiple drafts of that retirement letter? Uh, there were at least a couple. Um, so yes. Where the wording was kind of worked out? Yes. Okay. And um, you referenced a story that Bill Crane told. What story are you referencing? The, uh, I can't remember which newspaper it was. It could have been the Fulton County Daily Report, could have been the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, but uh, there was uh, suddenly a flurry of news coverage prompted by, as I understand it, Mr. Crane reaching out to several newspapers to tell a version of what happened on the night of that shooting. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you. That's all my questions. Okay. Any questions from the jurors for Mr. Quillen? Oh, yep. Deputy Murphy. I have one. What happened to the and? Fisher and Phillips, Fisher Phillips, you guys jettisoned the word? The, uh, the legal name of our law firm has not changed. It is uh, Fisher and Phillips LLP. Uh, and we operate in very, very many locations around the country. We're in more than 30 cities. And we've registered in our states of practice as Fisher and Phillips LLP. We made a decision uh, just a couple of years ago to rebrand the law firm, to choose a different color scheme, to choose a different uh, brand name. And so we chose to drop the ampersand and go with Fisher Phillips. Um, but we chose not to go to 25 states around the country and refile everywhere as a new legal entity. So we've kept the official legal name, but we are now known as Fisher Phillips. Thank you. That was very thorough. <laughs> I have probably one more question for you. Mr. Quillen, can you explain to the jurors what, if anything, happens in terms of a payout of the equity stake that someone may have paid in, uh, what if anything happens with that when someone transitions from equity partner to income partner? Does that make sense? It does. Thank you. Um, so under our partnership agreement, an equity partner as a fellow owner of the law firm has to pay in capital to the law firm. So it's almost like buying shares of stock in a way. And so when a person uh, ceases to be an equity partner of the firm, that under our partnership agreement, their capital buy-in must be returned to them within 35 to 45 days after the last day they're an equity, share, equity partner. Any follow-up to that? Mr. Rucker. This one. Um, this is States 132. It's already been admitted. You're familiar with this document. Are you not, Mr. Quillen? Well, I, 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 saw, I think I saw it up here on the board, maybe. Yes. Yes, but I, I don't think I've seen it otherwise. You haven't seen it otherwise. Okay. Let me just ask you this. Um, first of all, um, in 2013, we see, um, and these are records for um, Mr. McGowan, um, produced by Mr. Nation. All right. Um, equity partner status, 2013. And then here we see in the notes that he received an additional payment of seven thousand six hundred forty-three dollars for return of capital. Yes. That's what we're talking. That's what you're talking about. I think so. Okay. And then again, in so you can see now in 2014 he is income 2014 compensation and in the note. Yes. An additional payment of 47493 for return of capital was made. Yes. That's what you're talking about. But let me, let me clarify now, if you don't mind. Yes, sir. So when he became uh, a reduced schedule equity partner in 2013, when his, his plan went from full standards, I, I hope you remember that I said his, in his last year as an equity partner, that was not a year of full performance standards, and his pay was reduced commensurately. So when it was... Under our partnership agreement, his obligation to have capital in the firm then goes down by some amount, a commensurate amount. So what you're seeing there in that smaller return of capital is reflecting that change of his capital requirement as he went from 100% equity partner to 80%. Then the following year, when he's no longer an equity partner at all, then 
then in 2014, then he gets the big return because that's the return of all the capital he still had at the firm. Okay. That number reflects the return of all his capital investments? Yes. Okay. Any follow-up? May Mr. Quillen step down? Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you. We have time to start the next witness, okay. which we'll do. Yes. Thank you. The state calls investigator Terry Jackson. Before we start with investigator Jackson, if we go a little past five, and I'm talking five, ten minutes today, is that creating scheduling heartburn for any juror? Okay. When we stop for the day, we'll talk more about um, a schedule going forward, but I want to make sure we weren't blowing past the deadline. Deputy Murphy. Richard Ryan, do you swear and affirm that the testimony you should give the court today will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God? I do. Yes, ma'am. If you will, get as close to the mic as you can. For the purposes of the court's record, please state and spell your name. Terry Jackson, T-E-R-R-I-J-A-C-K-S-O-N. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, glad you stuck around all day. I'll try to be brief, although I don't think I can finish you this evening. So you might have to come back tomorrow. Okay. Okay? Okay. Can you introduce yourself to the jurors? Tell them your name and how you are currently employed. Yes, um, Terry Jackson. I'm currently employed with DeKalb County District Attorney's Office. And what is your um, title there at the DeKalb County District Attorney's Office? Um, investigator 2. Okay. And um, what are some of your duties and responsibilities? Real briefly. Um, basically, um, as an investigator with the district attorney's office, it is my job to assist any cases that come in, um, assist the prosecuting attorney with getting them ready for indictment as well as trial. Okay. And um, when did you start working in CAD? Um, April the 3rd of 2017, last year. Okay, April of 2017. Yes. So prior to April of 2017, how were you employed? I was employed as an investigator with Fulton County District Attorney's Office. Okay, and how were you assigned within the office? At Fulton? Yes. Um, I was major case, assigned to major case. What is major case? Uh, major case handles all um, serious felonies, um, murders, vehiculars, um, high profile cases as well. Okay. And um, can you tell the jurors how long have you been employed in the Fulton DA's office? Um, from September of 2010 until I left April of, well, no, let me go back. My last official day at Fulton was March the 31st of 2017. Okay. And can you tell the jurors, um, are you post-certified? I am, yes. What does that mean? Um, I have arrest powers in the state of Georgia. Okay. And... Um, uh, were you post certified as an investigator in the major case division in the Fulton County DA's office? Yes, I was. Okay. What was your last assignment before you left the Fulton County DA's office and went to the CAB? Um, I was um, the, I guess, head assistant chief of major case. I was over the major case um, unit investigators. You were in charge of the investigators in yes. the major case unit? Yes. Big cheese in that unit. I don't know if you say it. I was <laughs> Okay. Now, um, can you tell the jurors, um, before you left to go to the cab, were you assigned to work on any particular case? Yes. I was assigned to work on several. So, okay, several? Yes. You had to juggle a whole bunch of balls. I did. Was there one case more than any other case <laughs> that you were assigned to work on? I was, yes. Which um, one was it? MacGyver case. Okay. And can you tell the jurors, um, when did you get assigned to work on the Magasa case? Um, January of 2017. Roughly four months before you left the office? Yes. Okay. And were you assigned to work with any attorney in particular? Yes, I was. You, as well as um, Linda Donikoski. She's another attorney in our office. Okay. And um, can you tell the jurors, at the time that you were assigned to work on this case with me, um, was the defendant charged by the Atlanta Police Department? Yes, I believe he was, yes. Okay. That's how we got involved in it. That's how we got involved in it. So, um, 
and explain that to the jurors. Um, so typically when a case comes into the district attorney's office, the person has already been, in ch been charged by the arresting agency. And so our job is to just work it up. Um, basically whatever investigative things that did not get done, if there's any outstanding questions, once we review the case, it'll be my job to follow up and get those things done. Okay. And in this case, the arresting agency was whom? City of Atlanta Police Department. Okay. And can you tell the jurors um, um, when homicide cases are received in the major case division in the Fulton County DA's office, um, is there a decision made to just automatically charge the case with the No. No. What happens? Um, the case is reviewed. Um, we actually have an indictment section in the DA's office. Um, an attorney as well as an investigator, they'll work it up. It is presented to Mr. Howard and he will then make the decision when it's going to be indicted. Let me, let me object, <clears throat> okay, but just outline your concern. Cases are trying to get into something that's not. Okay, that's fair. Um, I, I, I can. You've gone. You think you've gone far enough? I have. Great. Thank you, Mr. Howard. Now, um, with respect to the work that you did in this case, what was? Oh, strike that. Let me ask you a better question. What's the first thing you did? with respect to investigating this case once it was received within the DA's office? Um, the very first thing we do, or I did, is read um, what City of Atlanta had done, um, went over their notes, and so I reviewed all of the evidence that was in the case at that time. Okay. And then what did you do next? Um, after that, we then began to set up interviews. So I set up interviews, wanted to re-interview um, witnesses. Um, and kind of go over the physical evidence, the vehicle, and stuff like that. Okay. And so, uh, can you tell the jury, um, um, were you able to set up interviews that you and I both went and participated in? Yes, I did. Okay. Could you give the jurors some, well, first of all, strike that. Let me lay a little bit better foundation. In connection with the work that you do, did you reduce some of your activities to writing? I do, yes. And why do you do that? Because typically, It'll be a while between, so if I come to court to testify, I want to be able to remember um, and kind of recall what happened. Okay. So in connection with the work you did for about four months on this case, did you reduce some of your activities around? I did, yes. Okay. Um, the purposes of our conversation, I'm, can I call them notes? Yes. Okay. Um, and um, are they verbatim recitations of the things people say or... How is it that you reduce what you do to write it? Um, for this case, I just did a synopsis um, of the interviews, the different people I spoke with, um, who was who on the case, and stuff like that. So that was pretty much it. Okay. Um, do your notes uh, reflect the names of the people that you talked to? Yes. And their contact information? Yes. Okay. And. Um, you have a document there in front of you. I'd just like for you to just tell us what it is. It's the synopsis that I typed up. Um, as I was leaving the office the last day, my last day, um, I typed a brief synopsis because someone would have to come in and complete the case. And so they would know what I did, where I stopped off, and then they could pick it up and go from there. Okay. About how many pages is that document? Eight. And um, you had a chance to review it prior to the testimony here today? Yes. Okay. Um, if you need to look at it again to refresh your recollection, just let us know ahead of time, okay? Yes. Okay. Um, can you tell the jury um, the names of the, some of the people that, no, not some of the people. Tell the jury the names of the people that you talked to. Um, okay. So... Do you want the lay witnesses or everybody? Uh, start with the lay witnesses. We kind of categorize them. Okay. So um, 
went over to Cory Industries is where the victim worked in this case. And at that place, we spoke with um, Ken Rickard, um, Elaine Williams. Are you referring to the notes now? I am. I'm sorry. Okay. Yes. All right. And you need to do that to refresh your recollection? Yes. Okay. How, at this point, I'm trying to see the, the relevance, it, it, depending on what might be argued about the thoroughness of the investigation, but I don't see that. That, that, be, that will be one issue. Secondarily, I expect that we will get to a lay witness named Janie Calhoun. Well, we could ask that. Oh, we can ask that. Okay. Um, <laughs> Did, um, did you come to speak to uh, Jamie Calhoun? I did, yes. And can you tell the jurors, how did that happen? Um, um, well, during the course of the investigation, I received information that she was the victim's best friend and the next door neighbor of um, the MacGyvers. And so she could possibly have some information in reference to the relationship and kind of what happened. Can you tell the jurors, um, were you able to speak to Jamie Calhoun? Yes, I was. Where did that occur? Um, we met at Alon's um, bakery. Um, it was the one, so please forgive me, it was by the mall. I remember it was by the mall. I'm really not familiar with the location. I want to say Perimeter Mall, um, but yes. Okay, and can you tell the um, jurors, were you alone or were you with others? No, I was with others. Um, you was with me as well as Linda Donikoski, the other attorney on the case initially. Okay, who was Sean Kilpatrick? She's a paralegal um, who's working in our office as well. Did she go out as well? Um, I don't remember her being there, no. Okay, and um, can you tell the jurors, um, you recall the time you met Ms. Calhoun? I do not recall the exact time. However, I do recall it was in the morning. Um, and so I am just guessing, but it was, I know it was after 9, because I didn't get into after 9, um, but it was around 10, 10.30. Okay. Before and lunch. Before lunch? Yes. Okay. And can you tell the jurors a little bit about the environment in which we talked to Ms. Calhoun? Um, so we spoke um, in the inside area. There's like a patio area and then an inside area. So we spoke in the inside area. Um, it is um, a bakery. There's different, I guess, you like a little coffee area. There's a area, place where you can get pizza, sandwiches, and if you're not familiar with it. But that's kind of how it was set up. Okay. And um, how long did the conversation with Ms. Calhoun last? Um, it was over an hour. So, yes. And can you tell the jurors um, what was the subject matter that was discussed? So um, initially wanted to try to get a little bit of background. Um, she was very good friends, if not the victim's best friend. Um, so I kind of wanted to get a little bit um, victimology. How was the victim, the relationship between the victim and her husband? Um, and then kind of what happened after the incident. Um, how did she come to find out about it and those type of things. Okay. And um, un so um, can you tell the jurors uh, in this conversation with Ms. Calhoun, um, did we talk about with her um, not only how she found out about the death of Ms. Ngaira, but what happened in the hours and days after? Yes. And specifically, we talked to her about um, in conversations she would have had regarding cataloging or organizing Ms. McGowan's personal items for sale. Yes, we did. And can you tell the jurors what date or day did Jamie Calhoun tell us she would have had those conversations regarding 
cataloging and organizing Ms. MacGyver's personal items for sale? Um, she said that it was um, two or three days after the death, um, and that kind of stood out to her. Did she, um, um, did we ask her how she felt about that? Um, not sure if... Stop for a second. Yes, sir. Okay, okay. Well... Why don't you fully express your yes, concerns so he doesn't sorry, read for Go ahead. <laughs> He's asking, the state is asking what he, being Mr. MacGyver, said. The witness is Ms. Calhoun. So it's not what Mr. MacGyver said, it's what Ms. Calhoun said. Okay, I heard a different question, but had a concern. But why don't you repeat your question, um, and then we'll see if there's an issue with that. Okay. It's late in the day. Let me test my memory. But I think my question was, did well, Ms. Calhoun... question you want to ask. You don't have to be a complete... Okay, speech. okay, okay, okay. Um, did Ms. Calhoun tell us she had some reservations about going through Ms. MacGyver's things and organizing them to sell them? All right, stop. Form of the question. That's okay. I mean, that's, it's a leading question. Sure. I believe what you had asked was, did she tell you how she felt about that? Right. Mr. Harvey heard he rather than we. He had said we. Um, okay. But I, I, I agree with right. Mr. Harvey. A more open-ended question right. is appropriate in this right. setting. Um, did Ms. Calhoun tell us how she felt about being asked to catalog and organize Ms. MacGyver's things? If you recall. No, I, I don't recall. Um, okay. Okay. Um, let me see. Do you think it would help to refresh your recollection if you reviewed your notes under the section entitled Janie Calhoun Ball? Yes. Okay. Let me see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. If you would go down nine lines. I can direct you right to it. Just read that note that you wrote to yourself silently, and then I'm going to ask you a question. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now that you've had a chance to um, read over your notes, is your recollection refreshed about what Ms. Calhoun may have told you how she felt about being asked to organize and categorize Ms. MacGyver's things? Um, so... Yes and no, if I can explain. Okay. So. What's the yes first? Um, the yes is that I do remember her telling me how she felt about um, the selling of her things, her friend's things, Miss um, MacGyver's things. Okay. The no is about her cataloging. Oh, okay. 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 Let me ask you a different question then. Did Ms. Calhoun tell us how she felt about Ms. McGovern's things being sold? Yes. Okay. <laughs> and what did she say? So she was upset that um, he, um, Mr. McGovern was selling her friend's things. Um, she said that she didn't understand why he was selling the things so soon after the death. Um, it wasn't like he needed the money. She felt that he didn't need the money. That's what she told you? Yes. Now, um, can you tell the jurors, um, during this hour-long conversation with Janie Calhoun at the uh, at Alon's, did we ask her, hey, what did the defendant tell you happened to your best friend? Yes. And can you tell the jurors, did Ms. Calhoun give us any details about anything that the defendant told her happened in the backseat of that SUV? Um, the defendant, no. So, um, can you tell the jurors, um, when we asked her, hey, tell us what text says happened, what did she say? Um, she said that he told her it was an accident, um, and she, he didn't want to talk about it over the phone. Um, 
let me just ask you this specifically. Did she ever uh, tell us at any time during that meeting that the SUV stopped? No. Uh, did she tell us at any time during that meeting? What they're doing is they're trying to impeach their own witness. Yeah. Their own witness did that, which they can do. Sure. Their witness never said those things. It was their witness that they could have asked the questions. They didn't. So this is impeaching a non-existent phrase. So you're saying, just so I'm following this, if, if Mr. Rucker just asked, did, did Ms. Calhoun ever say in the interview at Alon's that Mr. MacGyver told her that the SUV stopped? Um, and you're saying that you don't believe that that's what Ms. Calhoun said when she testified? Okay. <clears throat> I, I, I'm, you, the court? Does the court recall the testimony? Yeah, I, I yeah I'm recalling something different um, than what Mr. Harvey is saying. Okay. Me then, too. Okay. okay. Um, the, the, rec, the jurors are going to remember what was said, but I, it's a well placed yes. objection. I don't think the record supports the objection, and so I'm going to overrule the objection. Okay, thank you. Am I allowed to ask questions? Yes, you can. Okay. Um, did Ms. Calhoun tell us while we were talking with her at Lyons? Um, drinking coffee, right? Yes. Did she tell us when we asked her what the text say happened? Did she ever say, hey, he says the SUV stopped? No. Um, did she say, hey, text told me that the gun went off? No. Did she tell us anything about, hey, text said there was a puff of smoke? No. Not, no. But when we did ask her about the relationship between the defendant and Diane MacGyver, her opinion and her observations, um, what did she say? Um, her opinion was that it was a very loving relationship. Um, she never seen them argue or have any type of disagreements. Okay. Judge, I, I, I've got a little bit more, um, and it would require me to pivot to another section I probably have maybe another 20 minutes. Okay. I think we'll stop here just because you're changing directions. Um, and I don't want to exhaust our jurors on day one, but we, we may expand the bounds of our starting and stopping time if uh, that's what the jurors would like to do um, so we fit more into each day. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to end for the day. Um, tomorrow, you don't have to listen to me for 20 minutes about what your role is. You won't have opening statements. Um, we'll pick right back up with Investigator Jackson's testimony. She'll still be on direct examination. And then uh, Mr. Harvey will have an opportunity to cross-examine Investigator Jackson if that's what he wants to do. And we'll keep on rolling with witnesses. Um, a couple of logistical things. There may not be someone, and some of you may have experienced this, um, who answers the buzzer before 8.30. Um, nothing wrong with getting here early. Um, the good news is, is that the freshman's cafeteria opens before I'm awake. Um, and so by the time you get here, you can go right into that cafeteria, relax, eat their good food, not eat their good food. Uh, but there's a place that's warm and dry with seats. Uh, you can read a newspaper, as long as you don't read about this case, read a book, whatever you're doing um, in freshments. Um, and then as soon as um, the buzzer is staffed, we can let folks in who may have gathered before 8.30. Um, and we will uh, move forward that way. Um, I received good feedback from Deputy Murphy that one of the bulbs of the overhead projector had originally been trained almost like it was an interrogation lamp on one or more of you. But we've angled it downward, so hopefully that's not an issue going forward. But that's exactly the kind of feedback you ought to give to me or Deputy Murphy so we're making your setting uh, as comfortable as possible. Um, we can't start until all 15 of you are here tomorrow. The goal is to get started at 9 and run throughout the day. Uh, any logistical questions at this point?
Okay. Uh, I'm so sorry. I thought at one point the court said tomorrow we might be starting come late. Have we? Tomorrow's Wednesday the 14th. Yeah, I had said that, and I had to get okay. drug court to go somewhere else because right. jury selection was such a fun affair. All right. Um, so we're going to start it, and I, I had exactly said that. Okay. Um, um, but I canceled. All right. So I'll be here a little before nine. You should be too. Well, Mr. Harvey should be. You can show up when you want. Um, but uh, we're going to try to get rolling at 9 a.m. and press on throughout the day. Um, no logistical questions from you all. Then I'm going to invite you to go with Deputy Murphy into the jury room. You can leave your pads there. They'll be private there. No one's going to go through them. Uh, you can collect them in the morning. Reminder. Um, no outside research, avoid media coverage of this matter, and for all those well-wishers who want to talk to you about how your day went, just tell them it was a great day, and then talk about something else, okay? Thank you so much for your time. See you in the morning. All rise for the jurors. Investigator Jackson, you're free to step down. Um, you ought not to talk about the case with either side between now and your return to the witness stand and we'd love to see you a little before nine. I know you say you're a nine o'clock person, but a few minutes before nine would be great. Yes, sir. Thank you. I've had the opportunity to review the interview with APD and the two lawyers and Mr. MacGyver and if you, if whoever is going to be um, exploring this wants to jot these down, I have some page and line number demarcations of what I think um, ought to um, come in. I focused on the good rather than the bad. Um, so please look at this and then I'm going to ask the two sides to confer. Um, you just need to state, you need to let the defense know when that witness would be coming. If that's not till next week, this doesn't have to be the number one item on your list. Uh, but I'm giving you what I think ought to come in so we can frame the discussion more than, hey, some of this shouldn't come in and some of it should. So um, part one, which is when Mr. MacGyver is not in the room, the two lawyers are talking with the two detectives. That runs from pages 2 to 26. These excerpts appear to me to be agent admissions. I'm not saying I've ruled on that, but these are pretty clearly, it is the attorney, whether it's Leipold or Maples, and it may be mislabeled, says, he says, and it's not, he was a good shot in the Air Force. It's, he says they turned left on Piedmont or something like that. Um, and not Danny Joe says, but he says. And so I think this is very clearly in the alley we ought to explore of, Okay, did the attorney have the authority to say these things on behalf of Mr. MacGyver? That's the filter I used. Then we can talk about that. Um, and it may be when you all look at what I've, identif what I've identified, people back off the agency um, dispute, the state backs off that we think we should get the other stuff in and you've got what everyone agrees to. Anyway, um, page 6, line 16, through page 7, Line 13, page 7, line 23, through page 8, line 7, page 8, line 17, through page 8, line 24, only three more of these left, page 10, line 25, through page 11, line 11, page 13, lines 10 through 12, and finally page 14, lines 10 through 14. If the state thinks there are things I've omitted that ought to come in, you can flag those, but I would focus on these, and Mr. Samuel can examine these um, as to whether there's an agency issue, an 801 2D or not. Um, part two of the interview is when Mr. MacGyver is in the room and is talking. I don't think that you can press play and run through all that because there are some times when the attorneys are talking um, and there are times when they, Mr. MacGyver is saying, Danny Joe said, um, and it's not clear to me that that will come in. Um, my filter applied to all that um, comes up with three segments to part two. 
page 26, line 3, through page 42, line 11. That would be a big segment. Line 11. Second segment is page 44, line 14, through page 49, line 19. And finally, page 51, line 1, through page 53, line 25. And as for part 3, I don't think any of it comes in. So I would invite the state to identify the segments of part three, which would be pages 57 to the end, what segments they think ought to come in. And it, it is not, I don't think it comes in, but I'm open to hear from the other side. There are many transcripts that are in existence. We need to make sure we have the same transcripts that you're using. Sure. Just that one was done by a court reporter, one was done by Mr. Nagel's court reporter, one was not in that's what you get. I get it now. Thank you. This is the words expressed. It's dated September 28, 2017. Um, it says MacGyver Interview One, um, and it says attorney's name Kristen Granville. Don't know who that is, but that's one way to identify. I bet you don't have a lot of other pieces of paper that say Kristen Granville. Oh, okay. I don't. When I know this in the court, I also know it's Mr. Samuels. Great. No problem, thank you. So that, but I appreciate, it. I didn't realize, so those line numberings may be completely okay. different on it. It may be saying, what are you talking about? And you reserve the right to still say that, but no please say it based off of this transcript. Got it. Okay. Um, that was the homework I was able to do on some of our outstanding issues. Um, good job, State, in terms of having witnesses here. Um, have more here tomorrow, uh, starting with Investigator Jackson. Um, anything else from the state side? No, sir. Okay. Anything else from the Ms. Clark Palmer? Thank you for carrying the defense today. Um, Mr. Harvey did manage to get a couple of objections in there, but um, uh, anything from? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> you got one thing. I'm sorry. I understand that there was talk of the whole stipulations with respect to one of the witnesses we were going to call Special Agent Lisa Arnold from the GBI, and if so, she's here, but we can release her and then we would just keep it rolling. Okay, I don't need to get in the middle of that until it's cemented. That's great if it's streamlining things, but no pressure on anyone. Yes, I think we can. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I think we can. Okay. You can. Okay. Anyway. You just should sort out in advance is the stipulation a, a written document that's going to we'll be out. admitted? We'll work it out. Or is it going to be a statement that one of you make saying the parties have stipulated to that just so there's not a dispute later on. Okay. Great. You'll work that out. Uh, anything from the defense beyond maybe there's a stipulation to Special Agent Arnold? No? Okay. We'll see everyone a little before 9.